Well, good morning, everybody. Um, and thanks for inviting me to um, present our work. Um, my name is Graham Ford. Uh, I'm the director of Graham Ford Architects. We're a small five person practice in West London. And um, we, we currently are designing railway stations, banqueting halls um, and sports clubs. Um, and we also work on houses. Um, now I um, studied in New Zealand and in uh, California at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, and following graduation, I won a scholarship to travel the world and visit sustainable buildings. And I then completed a master's degree in sustainable development. Now, following that, um, I worked here uh, for large practices. And then I set my own practice up about 16 years ago. And I've just completed a practice-based PhD through RMIT's European campus in Barcelona. Um, now, just to, just to introduce our work, uh, I, will, I will show you a film uh, that I made for the PhD, which gives you uh, uh, some background on, on the practice and, and the influences on the practice. During this PhD research, I've spent time mining my mental space and I've uncovered an archive of images and memories of houses, yards and churches that have formed my spatial intelligence. I've been influenced by the landscape and the idea of the road as a connector between communities. And I've been inspired by artists who have used abstraction to understand the qualities of the landscape. The simple forms and spaces of the modernist houses of my hometown are another source of my archive of spatial images. I worked in practices where I learned to use technology in innovative and unusual ways, rethinking how buildings were made and the details that were designed from first principles. Construction was part of the everyday experience of going to work. Since 2000, the context within which many of the projects in this presentation developed is high-tech architecture. Some of my work has taken inspiration from this long tradition of technological know-how and through the reflection on the projects I've worked on during the last 16 years, it became clear that the typology of the pavilion is significant in my work. I've been influenced by the Eames House and the houses of Glen Merkett in particular. The detailing of the structure and the cladding and how the relationship between the inside and the outside was dissolved. The underlying motivations in my work include the use of technology and the idea of a kit of parts in the resolution of the design and designing buildings that utilise natural ventilation and use less energy. So um, the film talks a lot about spatial intelligence, and this is the first of the two big um, things that the architect brings to the table. So Howard Gardner, who, um, who came up with this theory of spatial intelligence, was a professor at Harvard University. And um, as you can see here, there's, these are all the, uh, the different intelligences, and, and the architect um, has specific um, skills in spatial intelligence. The architect's um, spatial intelligence is in continual evolution as it develops with every project. So this is the interior of the roundhouse. It was the first project I built in the UK. Um, now, some of you may know it, it's a famous music venue. Um, and a lot of magic can happen when you combine the old and the new and, and you reuse as much as possible, um, conserving embodied energy. Now, I'm not going to talk um, in, in great deal about adaptive reuse, but um, a lot of the work my practice does is, is involved with reusing old buildings, um, which we believe is inherently um, sustainable. Now, the vision um, for my practice is to design sustainable energy producing buildings, cities and landscapes in one fully functioning system that does not degrade our life support system. 
Now, when I talk about our life support system, I mean I mean the planet, of course, um, and the natural systems that support us. The world's population has dramatically increased over the last 250 years, and there's been an exponential growth since 1950. So to meet the needs of 1 million new people on the planet every week, we need to accelerate the manufacture of buildings off-site that are energy producers, not energy consumers. We all know that the Earth's ecosystems are under threat. And a couple of key statistics, which I think we should bear in mind, is that vertebrate species populations have dipped on average 68% between 1970 and 2016. And changes in land use, such as housing development, deforestation, and loss of habitats accounts for 50% of the threat to Earth's biodiversity. Now, I've developed a set of principles um, for overcoming all the issues that our clients face, which I've called the SPECS principles. Now, this stands for simplicity, precision, efficiency, collaboration, and sustainability. To help us navigate the planning system, we use storytelling to help us build strong value propositions for each project. So I'll go through, as I go through the projects, I'll kind of talk about uh, these these principles and how we use them and why they're important. Now, one of the, the second sort of big thing that the architect brings to the table, apart from spatial intelligence, is um, the ability to synthesize complex things, sort of bring things together and pull things together. So architects have the ability to understand diverse and complex inputs um, across many disciplines, particularly engineering. So the more, the more skilled you are at understanding environmental engineering, structural engineering, mechanical and electrical engineering, the better you'll be at um, integrating and coordinating these different disciplines, like a, like a conductor in the orchestra. So the conductor doesn't necessarily know how to play the cello or the oboe, but he knows what they do and he knows how to make them work um, to their fullest capacity. So the first project I'll, I'll show is, um, is a completed building. Um, the second one I'll show is a project that's going through planning or has just, just, just um, got planning permission. And then the third one will be a project that's in concept design phase. So you can sort of th see three different, three different sort of um, stages of projects. Um, so when we talk about simplicity uh, as one of the principles, in a good design, you must design the diagram of the building right, regardless of the size of it. So the diagram incorpor incorporates ideas of sustainability. So in this particular um, project in Hyde Park, in the diagram is very clear. Um, you walk into the central space, there's views over the water. Um, the ticket office is here. For the for renting boats, um, management's here, and then staffs at the other end. So it's a very small building, but um, the diagram's clearly articulated, and it's important that um, the diagram includes um, ideas of sustainability and how you heat and cool the building. So this is the heat pump technology that we used in the building. And this is the natural ventilation sort of concept. Um, the screening of the sun on the western side, um, the uh, ventilation through the building, through the clear story windows. Um, so the diagram of the building, the simplicity of the diagram is very important. So there's the view of the interior looking out over the boats. Um, and here's the idea of the kit of parts. So the idea of the building coming um, in pieces and being assembled on site. The, the, um, I think this was important in the park to reduce um, disruption to, to the park. It was, the building was made off site, uh, all made in a factory and the steel frames, the columns, um, all the cladding panels, everything was made in a, in a factory um, to reduce the amount of time that the building was under construction in the park. So that's the building in the park under construction. Um, and this is a um, this is a 
document that I produced uh, for the client to demonstrate how the building would be taken apart. Um, so we had a sequence of sort of disassembly um, and this is these are this uh, these are the trusses. So this is a diagram of the trusses, um, and we worked out which which truss would come down first and in which sequence, so the whole thing didn't collapse. Um, so that it was taken down in stages um, and stacked up on site and then taken away on trucks. So everything was bolted together. Um, nothing was nailed. So as you can see here, um, all the roof trusses were bolted bolted through they could be unbolted and and say the trusses the steel trusses that supported the roof were all taken apart in pieces um in in manageable sizes so they could be disassembled and taken down so the report sort of demonstrates how that could happen and i think this is a really key um, idea in sustainability in that um Buildings need to be able to be adapted. They need to be able to be a dis disassembled and moved. Um, <clears throat> now, you can't do that with all buildings, but the more you can adapt them, the more you can change them, and the more you're able to move them and relocate them, the more sustainable they are. Um, this, is, this is particularly true of, say, sporting venues. So in the Olympic Games, we did design buildings as well, or I was involved with buildings where... Um, they were relocated from the Olympic Games to the Commonwealth Games. So they were pavilions that were constructed, um, which you saw in the film, actually. Uh, you saw a shot of the shooting range in, um, in Woolwich for the Olympic Games that was relocated. So it's an important um, part of sustainability, and it goes right down into the details of how you connect um, and put the whole building together so everything on this building is um, designed so it can be taken apart. And this is, <clears throat> this is what we call the technology stack. Um, so everything in the building um, is, is part of, you know, all the, the building is made up of a lot of different systems. So, um, you know, obviously the frame, the, tin, the, 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 the steel frame or the timber panels, um, the heating and cooling system, so the uh, the heat the heat pump, um, and of course the the key sort of the, the key um, uh, things for users of the building are good quality natural lighting, good quality artificial lighting, and indoor air quality. So really good quality indoor air, um, which we'll talk about um, as well soon in the next in the next few projects. So what we're really aiming to do for clients is design them a tech-enabled smart asset, an asset that's adaptable, flexible, um, has, has, and has uh, high quality, low energy heating systems, um, good quality natural light, um, and good quality um, air, indoor air quality. This is the second project. Um, now, this is a renovation project in a conservation area. The design is constrained by having to gain the agreement of the planners and the conservation officer from the local council. So the challenge, of course, uh, with all these projects is uh, that this is the existing building in the background. And we were very constrained by what the planners and conservation officer wanted us to do. Um, they really just wanted a copy of this, to be honest. Um, so we had to really fight them to design a building where we had a, um, a, a modern reinterpretation of this building. And we had we could design sort of large buildings with, with windows over landscape and, um, and um, vegetation. So we... Um, so that's this is a this is a banqueting hall for three hundred and fifty people. Um, so this is this is the new part and the client the challenge one of the challenges for this project was to distribute the new program in ways that um, was satisfactory to the planners. So um, uh, that, that, that that so that they weren't too bulky. They were in sympathy with the existing building. Um, and the client wanted these four spaces to be able to, to be divided up into separate meeting rooms, but also to be able to hold functions for 350 people. So um, that was our challenge. And 
to design the building, um, we, we designed the building so that we, we an analyzed the existing building and um, we set it out in relationship to the base of the existing building. Um, and, and we agreed that approach with the conservation officer. So we involved the conservation officer from the council in the, in the design process so that they became part of the design team. Um, and in this way, you de-risk the project. Um, if you involve them early, get them get, get them in a, uh, get them to agree the approach. Um, it, it helps a lot. So this is what we ended up with. We ended up with um, two pavilions made out of timber, um, uh, and then a link a link structure that um, was made out of white concrete, and then the, the sort of service bays here with the toilets. Um, uh, and what have you in this zone, which are a brick and brick and glass with with white concrete. So um, that's how we that's what we ended up with. And I think the um, the key thing is that the the sustainable approach to this building was to use um, wind catchers, um, and by using wind catchers, we reduced the amount of build up in the roof. Now I'll explain that. Um, in a minute. So in essence, the architectural approach and the heritage approach kind of worked in harmony or coordinated with our sustainability approach. Because if we if we didn't if we didn't have a natural ventilation solution, we would we would have would not have been able to design a link building between the pavilions with such a low build-up. We would have had a full ductwork and it would have been much bigger and, and um, we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we did achieve with this design. Now, I just threw this slide in just to show you um, the design approach. Um, we found this, we did find the design <coughs> quite challenging and, and the way I resolved it in the end was to get off the computer and to put the um, design on the drawing board and use paper and pencil to actually work out how I was going to how we were going to um, design the elevations and the volumes. So I think um, for you guys who are students, it's worth remembering that sometimes it's important to get off the computer and actually use paper and pencil to help you resolve design work. And you can quickly, you can quickly do little 3D sketches. You can think about details and you can think about elevations all at the same time. Um, which helps you design the building, um, and and this 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 helps um, helps describe the uh, sustainability approach. So um, these are the wind catchers here, and the wind catchers um, are an actual ventilation system that um, help us you know uh, help us ventilate the the big um, banqueting hall and. Um, uh, and they reduced the size of the build-up of the roof. So as I was saying before, this would have been much greater build-up if it was full of ductwork. Um, now these these um, wind catches are sort of full of variable louvers that provide controlled ventilation rates and expel stale air. And they also provide free nighttime cooling to the fabric of the building. So they sort of operate at night to sort of cool down, cool down these spaces. Um, which is which is important in a large in a large commercial building. The problem is usually cooling down the buildings, not heating them up, um, because they're full of people and equipment. And I think one thing to sort of um, which I touched on before was the importance of indoor air quality and natural ventilation systems. So it's worth remembering that in sustainability, the the key thing um, is. Um, good into air quality. So we can survive without food and water, but we can't survive without air. So our health begins with air. And in this particular project, we were quite a long way from large scale um, trans, you know, roads and motorways. So we were able to use filtered natural ventilation um, uh, and because we, we didn't have the issues of noise um, and pollution um, as you would in central London or central Manchester. 
Um, and we always use sort of simple um, diagrams to help us work out um, the relationship of the building to the sun path. Um, we do this on every project. Um, it's a very quick, easy way to rapidly understand um, the path of the sun in relationship to, to what we're building. So we know, for example, that this facade here on the new extension, which is here, um, is, is facing south um, and uh, at midday it's going to have a um, it's going to be blasted by the sun and so we're going to have to use louver systems to protect it protect all the glazing from overheating um, and we and we build models of our projects and these models are useful for conversations with the planners because in this particular project we could discuss the original pavilion we could discuss um, the massing of the new pavilion and we could talk about all the sort of extensions that have been made to this building over time which have, has changed the character of it um, so the model's a very useful tool for um, communication and um, and I think one other quite quite important um, thing that I'll, I'll talk about again in the next project as well is um, Having uh, having good um, partnerships with companies that uh, produce product products, you know, so partnerships with engineers, partnerships with uh, manufacturers, partnerships with suppliers, um, partnerships with fabricators who make bits of the building. So a building um, is um, is only successful if you're able to collaborate and form partnerships with quality people. So you have to have quality engineers that can bring your ideas to life. Um, and you have to, and you have to know who to go to um, and whose products are the best for, for, well, in, in this example, we're using solar panels on the Masonic Lodge. So we're going to cover some of the roofs and solar panels to generate energy on site. Um, and again, there's there's a lot of complications with planning with that, but um, we we're working through that at the moment. Now, this is the last project um, that I'll show. It's a sports club in Surrey. Um, the club wants to improve its facilities and expand its membership to attract families. Now, there are five existing buildings on the site that we need to work with. Um, so here's the site here. Uh, there's tennis courts up on the north side. There's a swimming pool. This is the entryway, um, car parking here, and there's, there's a community hall here, and there's a, a river that runs down to the Thames here called the Holtzmill River. And when we when we talk to our clients, um, we talk to them about trends or trends and their impact on real estate. We talk to them about future scenario planning. Um, we, we talk to them about their brand and how sustainability um, can strengthen their brand. We talk about future-proofing um, their business, so future-proofing with energy adaptability, um, flexibility for future change. We talk about adopting um, technology, um, and we talk about tech-enabled smart assets. So this project... Um, this is the sort of, this is the, um, these are the existing buildings on the site. Um, so there's a swimming pool here, changing rooms here, um, a gym here in the, in the old house, which is here, and uh, a community hall, which is, which is used by the local community here with this huge sort of car park in the front. Um, and, uh, and as I said, tennis courts up, up on the north side. Now, the, um, what we did, uh, our, our key idea was to design a central space here um, where people would come in and get dropped off, but that would link all these fragments of the site together. Um, so we wanted to link, link the community hall, the swimming pool, with this new pavilion building. So this new pavilion building sort of becomes the link uh, or, be, or becomes one, one part of this central strategy to link the fragments together. Um, so you'll have some car parking here, you so have some landscaping, um, and uh, and you'll have 
uh, new landscaping around the site, uh, and and this and, and then this new building up the top, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I think when we talk about sustainability, one of the important things is is when you look at a um, say an estate of buildings, you want to be able to connect that state the, that the state of buildings together. Um, that's that's inherently sustainable. So we, what our aim was to try and integrate as much as possible all the buildings on the site, so they became part of the new solution. Um, we're not really we're not really interested in um, knocking knocking stuff down and 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 um, and then rebuilding um, new buildings. We want to reuse what's there, not only. Um, well, mainly because it's more sustainable um, and uh, it's uh, it's a waste of embodied energy to knock them down. Plus, it's expensive. It's very expensive. Now the um, now the client. Um, this is this is so. This is what what we're doing here is this is strategic design. So it's called the strategic design phase. So we're using our spatial skills to help the client understand what's possible on the site and where we can place different activities. And following this exercise, we'll write their brief um, and then go to the planners and discuss possible scenarios for the site. So um, because it's in a green belt and it's extremely controversial putting building new buildings in the green belt, we, we've done, um, we've put the building where the client wants the new building, which is, we believe is is very big for the site and probably the planners will we're expecting the planners to want to reduce the size of this um, um but the, that's what the client wants so what we've done is we've said okay this is how we can organize the site this is the central space these are the existing buildings we can build a building here um it may end up being smaller than this but these are the that this is one way of organizing the site. Um, and, and as part of that process, we thought about how we would create landscape spaces around the building um, that would enhance the enhance the whole area. So um, this is a this is a kids' play space. This is landscaping on the boundary to protect the protect the whole site from the um, strong prevailing winds. Um, and this is the existing car park. So what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of hard standing on the site. This would be permeable paving, and we would try and use water as much as we can. Um, so we'd have, uh, instead of putting all the runoff from hard surfaces into, into the drainage system, we would try and use sustainable drainage and use water as much as we can, given that the site um, has a river sort of on its uh, southern boundary. And um, I think one, one thing that we normally do on our projects is we, we draw um, the building in relationship to the landscape. So we try and get a good understanding of scale by um, showing the proposed building in relationship to the old house and, and then in relationship to the whole site. Um, with the river down on the southern boundary. So that's something you guys um, can kind of take away for your own projects is, is, the, is that when you design a building, always, always, does, always think about the greatest site, the biggest site. So if you can draw it in section, draw it in elevation, draw it in plan, think about a site as an extended site, um, not, just, not just where you're putting the building, but the, the whole area. Um, and that'll give you a good feel for how the project sits in the landscape. And one of the things, um, when we talk about partnerships, um, we, and we talk about sustainability, we should think about social sustainability. Um, and we are trying to introduce the clients to um, different organizations. Uh, this is one particular organization we've had a chat to who, um, get young people, young disadvantaged people involved in sport. Um, and the idea is to involve them, involve this organization and getting access to the facilities that we're going to be designing for the project. So helping the community, integrating the project with the community, giving the community access, that's all part of the um, 
holistic approach to the to the to the project. And when when you when we do projects like this, we all, apart from looking at the sun, which we always do, we also look at um, hydrology, um, water, um, particularly if there's a river, which there is in the southern boundary, the flooding of the river, um, the aquifers, and also the the wind. So as you can see, this is a windrose from very close to the site. And you can see that the majority of the wind comes from the southwest. So when we design the buildings, we need to protect the building from the cold southwest wind in the winter, um, the prevailing wind in the winter, but it's also the prevailing wind in the summer. Um, so when, when the wind uh, hits this facade, so if we talk about the summer su summer scenario, um, what what's going to happen is that the, the wind is going to hit this facade. It's going to create a positive pressure here, and there's going to be a negative pressure on the other side of the building. And we'll use that pressure difference to help naturally ventilate the building. So the wind. So this is a section through the building, and we've designed the building. Um, so that it's it's lifted up at one end so that we can expel the hot air out through the clear story windows um, on the um, on the leeward side of the building. So the wind comes in through through here and the hot air ventilates out through the clear story windows. So the section of your building um, needs to bring light in. So we get light coming in through the through here and through here and it needs to work for ventilation so obviously it's a gym this is a large gym so it's not going to be fully naturally ventilated but um we'll use as much natural ventilation as we possibly can and just um in terms of um partnerships again um another example of a local local company that we're looking to partner with um is Urban, which um, they, they manufacture cross-laminated timber, and they're not far from where we're building. So um, if we can build this new gym out of cross-laminated timber, um, that would that would be an approach that's um, uh, that's a it's a, a sustainable approach using a low carbon material. So that's um, so that's the end of the lecture. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, and uh, I've tried to show you three projects in, in three different stages, just to give you a feel for um, how you try and integrate sustainability at each stage of a project. Um, so how you, how you look at it from a strategic point of view, how you um, integrate it with, your, um, with heritage concerns um, and how you make your building so that it can be unbolted and adapted and changed. Um, which we believe is inherently sustainable. So thanks for your time and I hope you um, I hope you all enjoyed the lecture. Um...